Hello everyone and welcome to Politics Today live on Channels Television. I'm Sean Okimbaloe. Tonight, our attention is on the security situation in the country, especially the issue of banditry in the northwest region of the country. And tonight, one person that has been very much involved in advocacy and negotiation, if you may call it, has been a popular Islamic cleric, Sheikh Hamad Gumi. He's our guest tonight on the program. Thank you so much, Sheikh Gumi, for talking to us on Channels Television. Just a pleasure for me to be with you. Thank you indeed. Let's begin the conversation uh, today about the Kagara boys and the students and those of their families that were abducted in the government science school in Kagara. Uh, what can you tell us about their location or their whereabout? Do you have any idea as of now? Uh, I cannot say uh, even the people we met in the bush trying to see if we can, which is a common knowledge that we have been going to see the militant um, and headsmen. They don't even know who did it and who actually is responsible for it, despite the fact that they have a lot of control here over the militants and bandits as of uh, two days ago. So of now, I cannot say exactly if uh, the authorities know where they are. Um, so it, it's a bit different from the Kankara situation. Uh, you seem to be apprised of uh, those who did uh, the abduction in the Kankara situation. But this one, you have no idea of uh, those who are involved? Uh, no, we don't have any idea of those who are involved because uh, actually we don't even know these people at all. But you see, whoever wants to meet them, depending on the channel of communication. And I think uh, the media should be trying to get in across to go and see them and speak with them as we do as clergy. Uh, then you will get to understand a lot of things which actually are, uh, are not uh, in the print. Uh, we don't know who they are. And the people we met there are the like warlords there. And they said it happened just two days ago, and they said the area is so wide. They don't know which group or which splinter group uh, did the kidnapping, but at all costs, they are going to get contact with them. And since we're in a peace negotiation with them, definitely they will lower them into releasing them without any, without any ransom. It took about six days mm. uh, for the Kankara abductees to be released. To be released, yes. Um, we're running into almost a week now. It's about Monday or Tuesday last week that um, the situation in Gagara happened. Um, from what you know... No, it happened on Wednesday. On you, Wednesday, yes, so, so, so... Yeah, in uh, another two days, it should be a week. A week, yes. Okay, so it's about five days now five days, yes, yes. that they've been abducted. Mm. Um, if you make a comparison from the knowledge of these uh, abductors mm. that you have, mm. is the Kagera situation more complex? Uh, no, 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 it's less complex because it happened in the process of trying to see these warlords and negotiate with them to leave, not negotiate with them, admonish them to leave this kind of uh, way. If you have any grievances, this is not the way you address it. And we have to teach them this. And uh, sometimes we only go there and speak with them. Uh, you see that, uh, yes, you really have to give them an excuse, although there is no excuse for any crime. Nothing can justify crime. Crime is a crime, and they are committing crime. But what, why? I think it's a population that is pushed by circumstances into criminality. And this is what we should look. Let's remove the pressure. Let's remove the things that made them into criminals. Because we have lived thousands of years without, <laughs> if, uh, without any problem with the nomadic uh, herdsmen. Peaceful people. You, you get your gas get stocks in, in the road, they come and assist you. So what happened? Something happened that led them to this. So I think uh, listening to them is very important. What did you discover when you listened to them? Well, when I listened to them, is that I found that actually it's a simple case of criminality which turned into banditry, which turned into ethnic war. And uh, some genocide too is happening. People behind the scene, people don't know. So now we are not talking about banditry, we are talking about ethnic war. 
The, so it's an ethnic war, right? Yes, now. it's going on, yes. So between which ethnic group? Oh, uh, between now the the, the, the nomadic Fulani, the headsmen, and the others. If, they are, the, if, others, if uh, mean, the others means the anybody who's not them. So you can imagine a, a Fulani man will tell me in, in Zamfara State that he cannot go into areas, like he cannot go into the town of Shinkafi. When the enemy of Shinkafi is a Fulani man, they cannot, so it's a, it's a war between nomadic Fulanis and the others. The others include Fulanis too that are sedentary. If you go there so, uh, westward, and the uh, Kadarawa of uh, Kebi State, there's war between them. If you go south with the Igbos and the Yorubas, and between themselves too, it's a complex issue that Nigerians need to pipe down, put cold brain and understand the issue. But I see the, the solution is very simple, but it's not military hardware. Anything but not military hardware. What's the solution? The solution is dialogue and teaching, because these people, they are acting with instincts, natural instincts, not with uh, special knowledge. <laughs> and they don't have any ambition or anything. When I, uh, they don't have, uh, what is the future? What do they look at? What do they want to achieve? They don't have that vision. They are talking about existence. Their livelihood is destroyed. Because the, rust, the cattle rustling that was going on for a long time, they are the first victim of it. When their cattle finished, then people started uh, rustling cattle in towns. So these cattle rustlers that came suddenly into the scene, this is the source where we should investigate, and we need psychologists, criminologists to investigate how suddenly cattle rustling become a booming business in Nigeria, especially in the rural Nigeria, and how it affected the socio-cultural behavior of the nomadic Fulani is very important. They are pushed into criminality, and I think the same way, if you understand, you can bring them out from it very easily and quickly. Okay, I'd like you to clarify something. Yes. Um, these elements, these bandits that, mm. you, that you've seen, that you know that you've spoken yes. to, yes. Are they, they are Fulanis, is it? Yes. They speak Fufu Day. They, they speak Fufu Day. So, and they speak Hausa. Okay. okay, so you call them the House of Flan? Yeah, this is what we call the House of Flan because of the, what do we call it, interlacing of the culture, language between the Fulani and the Hausas. But they are originally Fulani? They are, yes, they are physique and everything, they are Fulanis. Of Nigerian extraction? Oh, you know, they are Nigerians, no doubt about that. They are Nigerians? Yes, in fact, some of them have parents at, in, the, in, the, in the town. So why, for those who say, some of these criminal elements are non-Nigerians mm. who move uh, through the ECOWAS uh, territory, territory yes. into Nigeria. Is mm. that true? What, what happened is, you see, as I've said now, we are having an ethnic war. The Fulani nomadic feels his existence is threatened. So what they do is, when they have a war, they, they call other Fulanis from other countries, irrespective of where they are, Fulani is Fulani man. They go to defend their kinsmen. Then this part, each one goes back to Soroga. So this, that's why they, 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 what do you call it, they, they, they transit the borders, just for an operation and go back. But if there is calm and there's peace, you will not see this kind of uh, incursion of foreign elements into the nation. And that's why it's very important. Uh, the government is very proactive in this issue. Let's go in, let's educate them, let's register them, let, let us do what we do to others so that we don't have any Nigerian that can be susceptible to be used. If this money they are making is to take the land, they'll be buying uh, islands, they'll be buying uh, mansions, they'll be buying cars and this is, no, they're still in the heart. They're just trying to survive. It's just a misconception from both sides. People don't know. You need to go in. And I hope you follow me one time when I'm going in, to go with you and talk to them and interview them and see. And you see, for every victim you're talking about, victim of kidnapping, you have almost 10 times victims among themselves. They will show us, none of us here 
is not without uh, uh, a victim of violence, maybe killed by the military or killed or lynched in town. Do you know that there are situations to the extent that any, any man with this physique, uh, Fulani physique, uh, you're slim, light complexion, or even the dark ones, on a, on a motorbike is automatically arrested and incarcerated. The first time I went out, I ventured out into the Jere area, two Fulani men, we, we, are, we are dropped out of a, 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 a bus by the police and arrested. So their leader, Arto, they called them Arto, called, uh, came to me and said, Lucy, uh, when you came here, we called some of our uh, herdsmen to come across, and they were arrested by police. I have to send people to go and bring them out. He said, without you, inter your intervention, they could have, they, they would have had to sell their cows to, to get bail out from, from police. What's their offense? Profiling. He just that he's a full and new herdsman. This is the situation they are facing. So they are really fighting to them, they are fighting war to exist. Some of your critics say that, say that mm. you are deodorizing evil no. by doing that. You see, what they see, the Fulani hats man now, he's seen every all surrounded by him. You can imagine when he sees his children, women, everything killed, his animals slaughtered. You see what happened in Oyo, his heart burnt down. Who is burning down his heart? Is somebody coming from a building? Somebody coming from a car? He doesn't own a car. He doesn't own a building. He doesn't enjoy anything of the Nigerian cake, national cake. And then you are coming again to the little thing he has to kill his animals, you see? So he's seeing the evil from the other side. So each side is seeing the other side evil. How do we do? It's the clergy now that have to come in the middle. Muslims and Christians say, look, stop this hostility. Let's iron out. Let's listen to these people. What do they want? It's very important. For Demonizing anybody is not appropriate, and evil is there in everybody. But I mean, is it justice uh, for those who are being victims of their kidnapping? Some of the people have been killed also. Yes. Would you say there's justice if you are now okay. asking for okay. amnesty for those who have killed other people's children? No, no. You see, it's in, an, in an amnesty, it comes with a package. An amnesty comes with a package. What kind of package are you Package means at? all victims should be looked at and the government should compensate because actually it's the, it's the responsibility of the government to protect people, their lives and, and, and their live livelihood, and we are not able to do. So since it's a negligence from government, then government should come on both sides. I'm not talking about both sides. They are victims. And I'm telling you, for everyone kidnapped, there are 10 casualties on the side, the other side. Are you getting any kind of support in terms of funding? No, we don't have support except the states that adopt this, like Zamfara State, not funding, that, but they facilitate our movement, they accommodate us when we come, and that's all. But there's not any funding, but it needs funding, not only state funding, because they're Nigerians. I tell you, since when God created Earth, this is how they are living. Nothing of civilization. Besides that, gone they hold. So is it no, just I saw I saw two little girls. Uh, maybe I should put the clip when you're drinking from the stream, for where animals drink, uh, drink. And these are the kind of people people shouting. Uh, what do you call it? Bandits, bandits? No. People need to go and see their life. I mean, I was asking you, who is funding your trip? Because a lot of people will be asking the question. Who is sending Sheikh Gumi on this mission? You know, the mission doesn't require much funds. You see, wherever you are, in just a, throne, a stone throne to the to, to place, you find the Ruga of Fulanis. So we, it doesn't require much. We just buy some few little books, go to them. But you see, when I travel to a state, then uh, the states give us logistics. You know, they accommodate us in, in, in a hotel and uh, assist us with their police to escort us to a reasonable distance because there are some bandits, or I call them now militants, that don't allow police to near them. And there are some they don't care. We, you can go with the police and they are ready to talk. Why do you choose to call them militants? I choose and to not call them bandits. Little, yes, yes, because now they are fighting an ethnic war. They are kidnapping to get money. You see, now 
Look at the example, the case, the, the latest case where they release a boss full of people. They were asking 500 million more. Now they, they freed them with mere negotiation. They freed them free. Nothing was paid. Nothing was paid. Even one of the, the, the victims' uh, father was calling me, you know, thanking. You can ask the victims. No? And you broke out this deal? Yes, it's broken. You, you front, broke out it? In front of us, he said he's going to talk. He said he knows those who took the boss and he's going to talk with them. But for those who took the, the boys in the school, they are not sure of them. But he's still going to investigate who are they, who they are, and he's going to convince them to release them because there's a peace process going on now. How yeah. soon do you think this can happen? Anytime they can be released, anytime, any minute. Since there's a peace process, so they're ready to lay down their arms, stop kidnapping, stop all the things they're doing. And you see, even we call them killer headsmen, how many people do they kill? They only kill, sometimes and some of them are on drugs. Some of them are on drugs. So that killing is not killing to, they want the money. So they're ready and, and they're comfortable. They can keep somebody as long as they are because they are, they, they are in the bush, really, really in the bush. Getting there is very remote. They can keep somebody so they don't have, when they kill it, it must be accidental. Maybe somebody they took who is sick. But tell me who has they, they have killed. How many few? They've killed people. No, no, they don't kill. If they kill, in the boss, they will kill people there. They want money from the people. They want, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they burn down houses. They've killed oh, people. Oh, there, this is, this is another thing. That is the ethnic war. That's not mandatory. Maybe a, a, a nomadic man went to that village and he was killed or lynched. So they come in a group and ransack the village, not to steal, just to revenge. And this is their mode of defense, instilling fear. It's just like the honey, when you want to take its honey, the whole bunch of soldiers follow you. This is exactly, so that killing is not the stealing, you don't combine it with the, the it's not because of, uh, what do you call it, um, criminality, it's because of ethnic, ethnic revenge. And they don't attack a village, except that village did something to one of them. In fact, you see that they will pass many villages and go to the one that they have problem and attack it. So this is the kind of killing, but uh, I've told you it's a revenge. You, you were being heard, uh, you heard uh, on a video mm. online that surfaced, and you were making reference to the fact, telling the Fulani community uh, that non-Muslim soldiers were responsible for the atrocities against them, but that the Fulanis retaliate by attacking both Muslims and non-Muslims. What do you mean by that? Okay, this is a, a misrepresentation. And it's mischievous who does that. You have to listen to them completely. All of them that stood, they said, we are fighting because so, so, so is killed. 100 people are killed. 200 people are killed. Our fathers are killed. They didn't give you that portion. They gave you, and it's the military that is doing that. You don't trust the military? No, no, they are doing that. So I told them a case, which I can give you a clip. You should play it if you play this. A soldier came to me in 2014, 21st June, on a Friday. A soldier from the 1st Division, he said, I've just come to tell you something's happening. We are sent to fight Rostelers, cattle Rostelers. But he mentioned names, officers that we are killing communities of Fulanis. He himself, he said, has seen more than 300 civilians, men, children, and uh, women killed. By Nigerian military? You'd be surprised. So this is why, look, look at it this way. It's very important. Because this because allegation, <laughs> Sheikh, this allegation wait, wait, wait. is very grave. Wait, so wait, wait. I mean, this, uh, you're this saying is, that. This is, this is, that's why. Extrajudicial killing by extra the military? Extrajudicial killing, that was in 2014, in fighting Kati Rostelas. The bandits told us, when the military first came to fight the Rostelas, because they are the first victims of them, they were happy. But when they came, they were killing everybody. Then they turned into now trying to protect themselves from the military incursions. Let me tell you, this is, we have evidence. So now, I'm going to broker a peace with these people, and they know they are the victims of this military excesses. They are. 
And in the videos, they have told us they have seen more than 100, 100, 100 different people. It's so much successive that it can be untrue. So I said, I, just to reaffirm that we know what they know. If you look at what is happening, oh. basically, uh, one is curious. Sheikh Gumi is able to trace these bandits to their hideouts and meet with them. Why is it difficult for the Nigerian intelligence community or the Nigerian military to be able to know where these bandits are? They know. They know? They know where they are. They see them by aerial views. They, they have, they have uh, intelligence among them. I've met, I've met a Hartsman. I have uh, met a Hartsman who is he's part of the internal security. They all know. But the, the problem, I think now, the military has learned its lesson. The first approach they had, when they go in and start killing, they realize it's, it's the wrong way. And they realize they are producing a monster. So they are now very careful, watching and studying and seeing how they come about it. The only element now I'm adding value to it is that, look, don't just wait, just don't wait and watch. Go in and negotiate. So, I mean, if you look at what is happening right now, mm. um, you see a situation where some military or security consultants who have told me and said, look, what we see in these bandits or what we see these killer herders, there's some kind of Boko Haram. Do you think that these killer herders or these militants, as you call them, are some form of Boko Haram or some element masquerading as bandits who are really Boko Haram? I can say categorically they are not Boko Haram, but we have to be very careful. Because if the pressure is too much, being Boko Haram more international, more connected, maybe richer, if the pressure is too much, I'm afraid they can be influenced by Boko Haram. And there we have seen the signs that Boko Harams want to infiltrate them. But so far, they are not Boko Haram. They are, they are ready to lay down their arms. And there's an incident that happened in Zamfara during the former regime. The Fulanis themselves caught some few elements of Boko Haram and presented them to the, the government. Boko Haram, they're trying to preach them that. So they are not Boko Haram now. I'm telling you, they're citizens. They recognize the government, they recognize authority. Boko Haram doesn't recognize uh, nobody except themselves as the sole sovereignty, you see? So we are happy now that the Boko Haram is not in and that uh, we should step in quickly and, and give them the true Islam, which is Islam of peace, Islam of no compulsion in religion, Islam of compassion, Islam of mercy. We have to show them that. And this is exactly what I'm trying to achieve. So, but I mean, that's, those who criticize your style are saying that because you're not an authority and you're not able to prevail on government to make this happen, and that's why they think that your style and your plan is not viable. In this case, in Zamfara, in uh, Katina has fallen flat on his face. What capacity do you have to make government comply? Yes, because now we have got the Zamfara government on board. We have Sokoto government ready. We have Niger State 100% ready. So we, we are convincing both sides and we are getting results. The only remains the, the federal government. What about, about Kaduna State? The, no, in fact, Kaduna State, uh, um, is a very intelligent person. If he sees the picture as it is, I'm telling you, he will, he, will, he will change and accept it. So I don't lose hope with Kaduna State too. And Katsina too, um, we, are, we are planning to go to Katsina. Katsina have seen that too. They have seen relative peace when they had uh, with the governor, where it returned. Well, do we ask why it returned? It's because there are conditions which are unmet. Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, oh. thank you indeed for your time to talk to, him, to us on China's television. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me. And uh, anytime I'm ready to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.